exciting friends that I still have um, even to this day. But it was the place that I learned that I too am a scholar. It's a place where I learned um, uh, about researching and about writing and about um, 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 doing all of the stuff that I'm doing, teaching and all of the stuff. MTS opened up an avenue for me that I did not know even existed. I just thought I was just going to school and doing a, a master's or a master's of divinity, or at that time, I thought about even an MAR, but um, um, it is the luncheon pad, if you will. It sent me to the University of Memphis to do a PhD. Um, you welcome me back after I finish, and now the University of Memphis um, uh, have me, but they have me because of Memphis Theological Seminary. And let me just add something, just one more thing, and I get to the question. I really wanted to say this uh, about theological education. Uh, and I know there are some circles, and, I'm, and, and I don't think I'm, you know, um, sharing a secret or two, but there are some circles in which certain people don't believe that theological education is rigorous, it is tough, it is, um, and you, you know, it, it, it helps you um, um, with research and all of that. And I'm here to tell you that some of the best papers or some of the best research and some of the best ideas that I am still working on within a communication or rhetorical framework um, develop right there at Memphis Theological Seminary. So uh, I am honored and privileged anytime that I can do anything uh, with the seminary, any type of help or, or, or webinar or anything that I can do with Memphis Theological Seminary and type of teaching or whatever, I am there because Memphis Theological Seminary and theological education uh, made me the person that I am today. Now, your question. <laughs> I wanted to say that. I needed to say that. Appreciate, um, appreciate it. And, I, and, I, and, and you don't know this, but I really needed to say that for other reasons that you don't know. <laughs> but I need to say that. So um, Black Lives Matter, you're talking about the origins and how I got started. Um, um, after the Zimmerman verdict, it was um, uh, Elisa Garza, Oprah Tometi, and um, they talked about um, Black Lives Mattering. Our lives matter, Black lives matter. Hashtag Black lives matter. There you go. That's the start. Um, but um, what is it really about? It is the idea, and it's kind of funny, right? It's kind of ironic, I should say. It's the idea that um, Black lives matter, but in order I still have to say it because black lives, a lot of times they don't matter. Mm -hmm. And so it was after that verdict, after the egregious verdict in the um, Zimmerman trial, that people began to understand that, wait a minute, what's going on here? And that's how it takes off as a hashtag and it becomes this movement, it becomes this thing that we're still uh, um, not only dealing with for some people, but also what we are being empowered by as we continue uh, the long civil rights or human rights movement. Mm -hmm. So in what year was that? Hmm. 2013. 2013. Mm -hmm. Here we are seven years later. Um, so if that's the origin of the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, slogan, um, what about this All Lives Matter slogan? It was quickly a response um, because, um, you know, and this is what I share in classes um, pretty much all the time. And I talk about the whole notion of black and blackness or this whole uh, adjective black. You know, if black is in front of something, it's always problematic. Black theology, black liberating theology, black whatever, just fill in the blank, it's going to be a problem. So um, a lot of people interpret Black Lives Matter as saying, well, are you saying that nobody else matter? No, it's not Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. And that was the response. Now, in our book, we found some different interpretations along the way, which um, when you get into the book, you'll find, uh, I think, surprising. A lot of people would because 
there were a lot of African Americans, for instance, that subscribed to All Lives Matter. Because in the large scheme of things, of course, morally, ethically, all lives matter. All lives matter. All lives matter all the time, right? All lives matter. But when Black Lives Matter were highlighting the, the injustices that were happening to black, black bodies and nobody was being held accountable, when that was going on, Black Lives Matter adv advocates were actually highlighting the thing that everybody knew what was going on, but were afraid to say, or did not want to say, because it made them uncomfortable. Black Lives Matter is uncomfortable simply because deep down inside, a lot of us really, and we, we might not want to say it loud, out loud, but deep down inside, Black Lives Matter is problematic because it crushes all of the myths that America is supposed to have. Because we know that instinctively that Black lives don't matter to a lot of folk. Mm -hmm. And so what do I do with that? So I have to respond, all lives matter. But like I said in the book, there are different degrees of all lives matter, starting from just a um, pushback response, not liking Black lives matter, to just all lives matter, a, a, a disregard, if you will, or to a more, what I call a more um, um, nuanced understanding. Um, you know, some of the interviewees and some of the proponents were saying stuff like, you know, I don't want to say Black Lives Matter because I want to be inclusive. Because if I want to say Black Lives Matter, I want to say Black Lives Matter too. They wanted to put two at the end. And instead of doing that, I just want to say all lives matter because I don't want to make anybody upset. I don't want to make anybody, you know, um, uncomfortable. And that's the same thing uh, um, that we've heard about here recently about the pastor who wanted to, uh, Pastor Louis, who wanted to uh, not talk about white uh, privilege, but he wanted to talk about white blessings because white privilege was not a term that white folk really got into because it made them feel uncomfortable. But if you can talk about it in white blessings, so All Lives Matter was just like a response to Black Lives Matter to make folk feel a little bit comfortable in seeing what they were seeing with their eyes, you know, when Black Lives Matter activists were actually marching and protesting and saying Black Lives Matter. Well, how this is a question that's coming from uh, one of the participants. Yes. Um, sent it in. Of, uh, what, so what part or role does white fragility uh, mm. play in the Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter debate? Wow. That person must have read the book because that's a whole chapter <laughs> about white uh, uh, fragility. Um, Robin D'Angelo's term has really um, um, caught on. Uh, especially in this moment, um, because white fragility simply states that there is a spot or a place and a space where race conversations get uncomfortable to white people and they become fragile. They push back, they push away, they try to deflect, they try to recenter the conversation, or they get up and leave. And so where it comes in at is the fact that what Black Lives Matter activists have been saying, and which now more people, if you, re, if you believe in the polls, more people now are saying, okay, I get Black Lives Matter now. Took seven years, Pete, but you know, it, 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 people are getting on. Because what they are finding out is police brutality is just one of the several topics. Because what we also talk about in the book uh, near the end if that all lives matter uh, advocates, as well as people who will just push back on Black Lives Matter, if they would just uh, be open to the critique that Black Lives Matter was, uh, um, that Black Lives Matter um, charges against the country and against the system and against the economics and against the educational system, prison industrial complex, a lot of white folk will find that very interesting. But the fragility piece 
keeps them away from getting that information and getting that knowledge. So, um, so for instance, when we um, talk about um, policing, but we talk about the prison industrial complex, or let's just say policing for a moment. There are more white individuals that are shot and killed and abused by police. I mean, you know this, you've been working um, um, uh, against police brutality ever since I've uh, known you. But you can't get an audience if you don't know anything. I mean, yeah, you can't get an audience if you don't allow yourself to hear the critique out of Black Lives Matter and out of Black mouths and understanding that Black truth works for everybody. Because, you know, the old saying is that, hey, if you take care of this issue, your issue, uh, because we are so closely aligned, will be taken care of as well. So the fragility piece stops you from even getting help yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you get you look around where we talk about um, the urban and rural connections and you look around and people are dealing with the same stuff, <laughs> but the fragility piece, the race piece is keeping folk apart. And what Black Lives Matter is saying and forcefully uh, is that Black Lives Matter, this is why they matter, but also if you would just allow yourself the opportunity to be a part of this movement, you can see that it matters to you as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that that raises for me is that um, in the chapter where you talk about um, the emergence of the All Lives Matter in the context of these cultural forces of a climate of fear and socialism. Yep. And I wonder if you could connect maybe that climate of fear to white fragility. Is white fragility all about fear? Is that, that's is what that, that right? That that's that's the that's the foundation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's very interesting, though. People of faith having this fear because I thought we should not be, uh, we don't have the spirit of fear. But you know, but anyway, I just every now and then, Pete, I'm gonna throw out some biblical scripture, let people know that you know uh, I'm not you know. You're, you're just, <laughs> <laughs> theological seminary. Well, you know, just to let people know that I did, you know, I did finish back in 2002 and I learned something at Memphis Theological Seminary. Um, but, but that's what it's all about, right? It's about fear. It's about um, um, this whole idea and what we talk about in the book, the population shifts, the whole notion of what we talk about in, 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 uh, in theology, the scarcity versus abundance model. Of, of anything, if you believe that we are living in an area or a season of scarcity, you feel like you got to go out and hoard everything. And if anybody is getting, in your estimation, a favorable reading or a favorable understanding or a leg up, if you will, you want to push back on that and you want to fight and you want to, you know, because you're scared that you may lose something. Um, um, so it's all grounded in the fear and 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 of course we have those old tropes since the 19th century where when you put a black face on an issue or a problem that fear is automatically heightened as well too and so um this is one of the things that black lives matter advocates were talking about why are you so afraid of black people mm -hmm. now the other argument going back to police again because i know that's in the news right now the other argument is is that if you are so afraid of black faces and spaces or if that fear is so much then why are you doing the job that you're doing then maybe you should look for something else but that never crosses anyone's mind because we have now said that that fear is rational think about that for a moment the fear of another human being, the fear of immigrants, the fear of people that's not like us, act like us, think like us, look like us, uh, uh, um, the fear of groups of people maybe coming into the country, that's all legitimate. We have said that that's a legitimate fear that produces the white fragility um, and it stops a lot of people 
from really enjoying what it is that they said that they want to enjoy in the first place. Because it is not those people that we are afraid of that's really got us in the position where we find ourselves. It is the system and the spirit of the system, to be a little bit more accurate, bringing in some Walter Wink here, the spirit of the system that is producing the results that we say we're fighting against, but we just capitulate to each and every day by our fear. I'm going to think about connecting that um, that white privilege mm -hmm. part of the, and, and you talk about this a little bit in the book. I think the, the chapter where you're exploring the all lives matter, the the level of fear that is in white lives uh, is racial, but it's also um, social class, it's economic mm -hmm. fear. And how do those, do those intersect or, um, you know, what is it that, about that economic fear within white lives mm -hmm. that leads to um, fear of black people? Because it's the, the reasoning is that, let's, let's just take it back. Um, I won't say to the beginning, let's just step, take a step back that there is a myth that says if I work hard and if I, you know, keep my nose clean, the proverbial keeping your nose clean, right. and if I get up every day and I do this and I work and I go to work and I do what I'm supposed to do, don't get in any trouble, you know, raise my family and be a good Christian. You got to add that into it as well, too. Got to be a good Christian. That I'm supposed to be able to have stuff. Mm hmm I should not have scarcity. I should have a little abundance because God should bless me. Now, when that doesn't happen, one, it can't be my fault. It just cannot because I've done everything right. You know, so it has to be somebody's fault. So whose fault is it? It is the fallacy of the American dream and the fallacy of the myth of the innocent nation that collides together. And this is a work from um, Hughes, um, um, a book, uh, I believe the, um, oh, I got it right here. Yeah, Miss That American, Miss That America, uh, 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 America Lives By, Richard T. Hughes. He talks about these myths and how they collide. And of course, the foundation is white supremacy. But if you take the myths independently, you can see them merging together. Innocent nation, because my nation would not do anything to hurt me. Mm -hmm. right? it was, I mean, because we are all innocent and we don't hurt anyone else. And the myth of, of course, the American dream coming together to produce a fear that, wait a minute, I can get up every day and I can go to work. And one day I can go to work and my company and my corporation can be closed or my job can be relocated to another country. Mm -hmm. Now, whose fault is that? It can't be my fault. Can't be the nation's fault. Surely it's not my boss's fault because they got my best interest. It's those other people's fault. Mm. That's how it all meshes in um, together. And once that becomes, and then all you need now is the, uh, a person or a group of people pointing and saying, you're right, and we got to fix that. Mm -hmm. As they are constantly taking more away from you and having you believe um, um, that these other folk have caused you your economic distress, your health, your education, so on and so forth. Yeah. So that's how it all blends in together. And that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Well, I'm, I'm going to connect a, a, another way that people sometimes respond to Black Lives Matter. Um, yeah. So you have, you have the All Lives Matter, but then the next thing is uh, Blue Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, where'd that come in? What was its origins? Well, now, I was behind from our research, and we actually debated about, or we thought about, it wasn't a debate, it was just a thought. We thought about, should we include Blue Lives Matter? And we decided 
uh, against it because it would have made the book a little bit larger and, you know, so on and so forth. So, uh, but we did acknowledge it. Um, and even in the interviews, and basically what we did, we took um, people who said they were proponents of Black Lives Matter. We took people who said they were proponents of All Lives Matter. We interview them and let them tell us why. Mm -hmm. So we did not theorize, we didn't bring a theory and place it on um, what it is that we were doing. We allowed theory, if you will, to kind of bubble up. So um, um, some people talked about um, the police and blue lives and, and all of that. But again, here is where the rubber meets the roll. And this is why race is still so important and critical race theory and, and, and a racial critique is still so important. Even within blue lives, which blue lives really matter? We can just, I, right off, I mean, this is trying to keep it recent, right? We can just talk about Minneapolis, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, George Floyd um, um, was killed right before our eyes. You know, no, you know, everybody saw it. And, um, the DA, before they brought in the special prosecutor, uh, Ellison, the DA came out and said, well, we, well we're going to investigate. Now, these usually take a long time, takes about eight or nine months. And the people were like, wait a minute, hold up. Just last year or two years ago, I believe, when Muhammad Noor shot the white lady mm -hmm. uh, at night because he feared for his life and his partner's life, and he just shot in the dark. This same prosecutor said, hey, we can take this to trial and got a conviction. Matter of fact, he's the only one, as Ellison reminded everybody, to, to get a conviction of a police officer in the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So he has that to his credit. And whether you agree or not, it is just the point that BLM activists are trying to make and other people who study this is who gets punished even within blue lives mm -hmm. and blue and, and, and guess who else know that um, non-white officers of color know this too. And, and same thing in Atlanta real quick, the f five of the six officers that, that, that attack. And I use that word mm -hmm. attack those college students in the car just busted their windows, tased them, dragged them out, did a, they were African-American and immediately gone. That's no question. Of, mm -hmm. This was going, to, you know, until I'm thinking until, you know, the protests continued on, this was going that route. People were just being slow about it. And, mm -hmm. and, and so, so blue lives matter, even within blue lives matter, even in, within the critique. And you can see it online too depending on who is, who's the officer that is being charged, um, who gets the, well, they don't do too many, uh, go, I don't think GoFundMe do those anymore, but who gets those GoFundMe accounts? Who gets the uh, Fraternal Order Police support on Twitter and Facebook? Who gets all of that versus who just gets like, you know, um, you pretty much on your own. And um, so, um, this is why the race critique is still important, even in that, even in that. So um, um, a lot of officers and a lot of people are looking at now, and I know some research is trying to be, uh, is, is going on right now, are looking at the few officers who do actually get charged with a crime mm -hmm. uh, of killing someone. And who gets charged, who gets found not guilty, who gets guilty, and looking at those percentages. Mm -hmm. Well, some of that yeah. might have to do with the fact that uh, I think it's 99% of the lead district attorneys <laughs> in the United States are white. So there's the racism. That is another thing. Yeah. Yep. And, 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 um, and understanding is different. Um, one of the things that have you, you brought up the DA, one of the things that was kind of different was a DA actually having compassion for the victim. Mm -hmm. we, we're not used to the whole, that a lot. 
that, that talking about the victim in human terms, about his family or her family in Brianna Taylor's, uh, or, 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 uh, or talking about his children, talking about, you know, so usually you, you, you get that with the other side, but not with, you know, the victims. So I'm glad you brought that up as well too. Mm -hmm. um, hashtag your DA matters. <laughs> Absolutely well, the, the, the other part of that, that particular chapter, you talked about the cultural force of a climate of fear is you, the, the phrase post-racialism uh, was also used as, yeah. as a factor in the emergence of all lives matter. What is post-racialism and, and uh, how is it just not the case? Well, Pete, you do know that in 2008, we did elect President Obama. <laughs> oh, yeah, I vaguely remember that. <laughs> so, so, so since we elected President Obama, uh, racism disappeared. If for no other reason, let me just, this is a sidebar. If for no other reason, for everybody that's listening, I was rooting for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Uh, why? Because I wanted to be the first one to say, sexism has e been evaporated. <laughs> and people would have looked at me like I was crazy, and rightfully so. Come on. So, you know, so everybody lost it. You know, when that happened, that we have just, you know, tamed our demon, we rebuked our demon of racism, and people start writing about post-racialism and all of that, and and this whole idea that race somehow doesn't matter anymore. And and to show you how how important, or, or, or where maybe the word is not important, but to show you how strong that sentiment is, it finds its way into the Supreme Court. The reason why the um, part of the Civil Rights, uh, I mean, Voting Rights Act, Section 5, the preclearance was stricken was because uh, Chief Justice Roberts said that, hey, hey, look, People in the South have voted for African Americans. We have African. This is in his right. his, uh, <laughs> his decision. He's writing this like we you have our, so you don't need this anymore. Not thinking for once that the reason why you got those is because you have this. Right. <laughs> That's right. the equivalent of you know I'm waving my arm while you're waving your arm in the room. I'm keeping the elephants away, you know? No, no, the, 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 the pre-clearance is the reason why. And as soon as that was taken away, guess what happened? Just within one hour, I, I'll never forget, cause I, I, I talked about it and wrote about it. In one hour, North Carolina and Texas um, passed um, uh, ID laws, they passed, they closed up so many voting, and because they did not have to get pre-clearance or go to the Justice Department and say, this is what we want to do. Right. And so now you are in a position where you have long lines, and we're seeing this right now today, long lines at the voting places um, and, and, and so on and so forth, all because we thought that we were post-racial, that, that we have moved beyond race. Um, there's really no such thing as post-racial. We can be less racist. We can be anti-racist, you know, or, or uh, yeah, or, or, or racist. You know, there's no middle ground there, really. But you, you know, um, I'm, I, you might still be racist, but you can be a little less racist than you were, you know, last year. Mm -hmm. I guess, but post-racial, it was never a thing anyway. And when that becomes part of the public lexicon, when it becomes part of the social uh, consciousness of a nation, then people are going to act in that, in that way. And what happened? The backlash happened, and uh, it is not uh, lost on a whole lot of people that Black Lives Matter starts when the first African-American president, the first um, um, attorney general, African-American attorney general, mm -hmm. uh, first for a lot of things uh, around the country, 
it's not lost on a lot of people that it happened under that watch. So, uh, because of the backlash, and you know, King talked about this backlash back in 67 and 68, right up to, till he uh, was assassinated as well. So, um, um, yeah, post-racialism was never a thing. And we were trying to tell as many people as we, we could, um, um, but you know, it did take hold for a while. And now I think it's back out. It's just like, okay, we're not post-racial now. Because within the post-racial era, you know, in 2016, you go from a Obama to Donald Trump in eight years, not even a whole decade, right. eight years. <laughs> it, it really makes me think of um, reconstruction and then the destruction yes. of reconstruction and, and this sort of, um, the, the way in which the struggle for racial justice has been going on in the United yes. States, it's, it's a pattern of, of some level of progress met by um, pretty severe uh, backlash. And then things are, there's sort of a new status quo that gets established and then uh, there needs to be another movement that starts to move against that status quo. And um, so it's, I, th I think with the Black Lives Matter is, um, Part of the resistance to Black Lives Matter is this very sense of, of as you're explaining, of post-racialism. We don't need Black Lives Matter because we're past race. And right. That, so it makes people angry that even their mythology of post-racialism is being challenged. <laughs> right, and that, that, that's a great point, Pete. The whole mythology of post-racialism is being challenged, but it's being challenged on TV. It's being challenged on social media. It's being challenged where I can just pick up my phone and see black death trending. It's being challenged. It's, it's not even being hidden anymore. So that is, I can, I can only imagine for someone who has grown up with that myth, who really bought into it, who really sold out on it, mm -hmm. and seeing that myth crash and crumble right before their eyes. The cognitive dissonance that they are wrestling with must be huge. That yeah. that myth, like, wow, oh my God, that you mean to tell me that policing in my neighborhood is actually different? If I go to your neighborhood, I, I never would have thought that. I don't go to your neighborhood anyway, but I see it now because it's on my TV. Right. And I can't get away from it. And for better, or for worse, whatever you want, however you want to say it, I have told folk that George Floyd's death garnered this much attention for two reasons. It's on TV. And we were in the middle of a pandemic. There was nothing else to divide our attention. Mm -hmm. You had to sit there and watch that on a loop. Because we've been more on social media, we've been more on our computers, we've been more watching TV or whatever, and people have saw that and saw the cruelty, the cruelty. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we can talk about a, a little bit about ethics and, you know, and I think you uh, um, uh, are, if not the best, one of the best ethicists uh, <laughs> going around today. And you can talk about that whole notion of what is inside of a person that will make a person do that. And for a lot of people, that just blew up. That just blew their mind. It was like, wait a minute. A cop shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about this, I mean, you bring all of this to a head. And the only thing that's left to me, it's the truth of the matter that Black Lives Matter, and I need to be a part of this in some shape, form, or fashion. I might not be out there at night protesting. I might not chant. I might not carry a sign. I might not even have a sign in my yard. But I, but I need to find a way to be a part of this. And that's what we're seeing in this country right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think part of that, the... Uh response to the to the murder of George Floyd was to see the callousness uh, yeah. <laughs> in the uh, the officer that was that had his knee on his neck uh, mm -hmm. 
with his hands in his pockets. And uh, looking around. And looking around and, and knowing, knowing that the cameras were on. Cameras and that people were yelling, you know, get off him. Um, and the kind of nonchalance uh, in his facial expression, like mm -hmm. this is just another day, um, really, really hit home, I think, that, you know, th there's something horribly wrong here in the way in which policing uh, has been organized in the United States, especially in the larger cities, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that the, the uh, disconnect between the police and the communities that they're supposed to be serving um, really got captured, I think, in that video moment. Right. I mean, and, and, and shout outs to you, Pete, because you've been on this for a long time. You've been on policing uh, in, in America, policing in these large cities, especially as it relates to homeless populations mm -hmm. and how the poor are policed uh, in America. And, and so, you know, all that time that you've been working on that and all that time we've been working on that, we don't have the um, benefit, if you will, if you want to call it a benefit of a camera or to actually have video. But we also know that video, it doesn't really matter sometimes with video. So even if you have the video, sometimes it doesn't really matter sometimes. So, um, uh, so just, just a shout out to you for for um, the work that you have been doing and trying to bring our attention to this so that when people saw the callousness, as you call it, from um, Derek Chauvin uh, on George Floyd, then hopefully somebody will remember that, hey, wait a minute, I heard this about 15, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, I didn't want to believe it at the time, but I see it now because it's on a loop. And yeah, Black it continues to be on a loop. You know, one of the advantages that I've that I've had um, is that I've had really good teachers uh, from people on the streets who've taught me and showed me uh, what they've been experiencing, and then um, got to experience it myself a couple of times. Right. <laughs> so you know, just a yes. <laughs> story of when I was in Atlanta when working with the open door community. Yes. And we were serving uh, lunch in the in the front yard, and the police pulled up and they just pulled one of the homeless guests uh, off the property onto the sidewalk and handcuffed him. And I was in charge of the yard, so I went down and I asked the officer, you know, why is why is this man being arrested? You've come up onto our property, and the officer said, and you know, I hope that nobody out there has really sensitive ears. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the officer said it was none of my goddamn business uh, why he was being arrested. And, and I persisted, um, said it was my business that this, this person was a guest of ours and that I needed to know where he was being taken and what he's being arrested for. Well, long story short, I got arrested. Right. <laughs> uh, they, they took me right with him <laughs> with where they were taking them. Uh, but here is the inter one of the interesting things about that. Um, is that it was the first time I'd ever experienced being arrested in an unplanned way. Right. Uh, and there's a big difference between being arrested in civil disobedience when you know you're gonna be arrested and you're prepared for it and being arrested when you're not prepared for it. So that, that was one thing. There also, there were, there were uh, high white high school students in the yard that morning from the Candler School of Theology, the Youth Theology Program. Mm-hmm. They had never seen the police, I think, ever arrest anybody, uh, right. <laughs> much less a white theology professor, um, right, you know, for just asking a question. Right. They were, they were stunned. Uh, it was one of the, probably one of the best lessons that they ever got of just how arbitrary uh, police can be. Right. Um, and that's, that's not what white people often experience. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think you hit the nail right on the head that, uh, and and hopefully, and see, this is here's my hope. Everybody, you know, um, um, says that I'm kind of pessimistic, and, and sometimes I am. But here's my hope. <laughs> my hope is that those 19 um, um, Candler students learned something that day, mm -hmm. and they took it with them. That so that four years later, that when they hear of this happening, they did not act in disbelief. Right. I mean, that, that, 
this this is the <laughs> biggest problem. The biggest problem I have found, uh, Pete, is that you can ask a person. I mean, a lot of African Americans too. So I'm not. This is not you know just white folk, but you can ask a person about uh, policing and about being fair, so on and so forth, and almost to a person sometimes uh, person says yes i understand that and i know that but when they hear about somebody else's plight then they all of a sudden forget what they just said about police so why would you so if it was on you it's oh the policing is bad but if it's somebody else policing is good mm -hmm. i mean no don't so all i'm hoping is that those young people um, got it and they learned a lesson and um, somehow, somewhere, they are probably um, on the streets somewhere um, protesting uh, the injustice that, that, that happens. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I wanna turn us to the, to the last chapter of the book and have a few questions around that and then okay. open it up to, uh, to other people's questions. Um, Really interesting discussion in that last chapter about self censorship. Yeah. And, um, so, could you talk a little bit about what self censorship, what you mean by that, and how it's been connected to uh, discussions about Black Lives Matter, but maybe more broadly, uh, discussions of racial justice on social media? So, oh, very interesting chapter, very interesting discussions we had with. Um, both proponents of BLM and ALM. Um, basically, what we were talking about, that whole notion about self-censorship, self <laughs> and, um, and we got to talk about surveillance mm -hmm. as well into that. Um, and basically, what the BLM activists were saying that, you know, um, pretty much that I have to have two personas. I got my social media persona, you know, I got my friends at work, I got you know, other people that might disagree. And then I have um, um, my personal persona, where if we are in the same room, I might tell you some things that I would never ever share on social media. A lot of people had it the other way around as well too, that I am more private, but on social media, I am more public. And, and then we had this interesting conversation about the platforms on social media about self-censorship. And self-censorship just only means that I curtail my information or my post, um, um, you know, in a way that if you really, really, you might know what I'm talking about, but you probably don't, and that's okay, you know, like that. So I'm self-censoring myself. I'm not saying all that I can say about the certain situation. But a lot of people were saying like, okay, on Facebook, I'm one way, on Twitter, I'm one way, and then on Instagram. You know, you don't want to follow me on Instagram because I'm just, I'm buck wild. Matter of fact, you know, that's my name, at buck wild. <laughs> but on Facebook, I have the picture of the family, I'm nice and Korean, and so on and so forth. Uh, ALM, the same way. Now, Pete, very interesting we got into discussions about inbox messages. Mm. And that's where it really gets good. Because some, uh, uh, um, let's just say white folk who affirm Black Lives Matter. This is what I found real fascinating. So somebody can pull up a picture of Black Lives Matter or a poster or, or just hashtag Black Lives Matter. And all of a sudden, uh, they'll get an inbox, you know, from somebody at church. Are you sure you want to be putting that up there? You know, what other people are going to do? So after getting talked to like that, then that person might say, okay, I might step back a little bit and I might self-censor myself and not say that anymore. Now, what happens in self-censorship is a little bit of the fear comes back. So it's not under the white fragility per se, but maybe it's the fear of people not wanting to be called out or be challenged or to be uh, looked at funny or, or to be ostracized from the church picnics or the church functions. Um, it was very interesting. A lot of people of faith 
um, had to really wrestle with their faith and their faith traditions once they did not self-censor as they, you know, uh, um, as other people were saying that they should have. So um, that was a very interesting chapter. And, and, and so I really want to go back and look at that again, because I think what's happening now is that more people, even the folk who were ALM, are probably, and, and Amanda and I talked a little bit about this sometime last week, if we could ask those same people about BLM now, we were saying that probably half of them now would say Black Lives Matter. I, I get it now. Because the All Lives Matter was not enough to protect Black lives. Right, right. You, uh, I said I wasn't going to ask another question, but there's one. Oh, go ahead. That I, um, don't want us to miss. It's, it's called the the spirit led me toward an understanding of religious rhetoric and Pentecostal piety in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, uh -huh. I'm curious about it, what religious rhetoric do you see in the Black Lives Matter movement, and sort of how is Pentecostal piety present <laughs> in that movement? You got to read the chapter, Pete. You got to read the chapter. Right? I'm going. Here's the book. The book. No. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't ask the question oh, I read the, no, no, read the no. chapter title. Basically, what we argue in the book is that Black Lives Matter is uh, by far a spiritual movement. Um, it is not religious in an orthodox way, mm -hmm. uh, institutional way, but it's definitely spiritual. A lot of Black Lives Matter activists and advocates, proponents of Black Lives Matter, they were out there because their faith demanded it. The faith dictated it. Um, and many of them resonated with Black liberation theology, James Cone, um, um, a womanist theology, uh, they, Dolores Williams. They, they resonated with that type of theology. Very interesting about that chapter two. Two points I want to make. I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about it. Um, because a lot of people were talking about when you ask them what made, because my one of my direct questions to all of my interviewees, what made you um, move from online activism, just tweeting, to mm -hmm. actually showing up at rallies? What made you get in the streets? You know, that's fascinating mm -hmm. to me. I, I love those type of stories. Because what, what happens is when they start telling you Guess what it sounds like? It sounds like a call narrative. <laughs> that something pulled me, something led me. I felt something telling me I need to be down there. I said, somebody was saying, I wasn't going to even mess around with that stuff. But, you know, I kept watching it on, on Twitter. And somebody said at 4 o'clock, we're going to be down at the Civil Rights Museum. And I just showed up. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Those are call narratives to me. Yes, that's, that's that is a call. That's how we all got here, right? You know, they're called that something pulled me. So, so it does that. But two things I want to talk about in that chapter that I think is very important. Number one, for the black proponents of Black Lives Matter, even if they did not go or attend an institutional uh, house of faith, uh, whether a mosque. Uh, church or synagogue, if they did not go to anybody's church, they still drew upon the well of Black church uh, religion and Black liberation religion, even if they didn't know the language, you know, liberation theology. I didn't know that until I showed up at a seminary, right? But they, when you hear them talk about the power and, and, and justice and um, I felt like that was wrong. And the reason why it was wrong is because we're all human beings. When they were talking like, then you understood they had something to draw on. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it were from mama or grandmama, daddy or granddaddy, somebody, they drew on that. And that did not attend anybody's church. For white proponents of Black Lives Matter. Now with All Lives Matter, it was the reason why all Lives Matter for a lot of people was because of their faith, because we're Christians and all lives should matter. You know, that, that was the most on, on that side. But for Black Lives Matter, uh, white activists, they found themselves struggling with the faith. 
because they had nothing to draw on to tell them that they should be out in the street. Matter of fact, their faith told them they shouldn't be in the streets. And what happened to, uh, to several of our interviewees, they either left the church, uh, left the individual uh, church, not the denomination. Some left a denomination. And some is just, some are still wrestling with, I got to figure out the way, figure out a way why I'm here, why I still believe that Black Lives Matter. My faith, I have nothing in my faith tradition that can help me. And this is the problem I'm having, or we all should be having, when a lot of white pastors who are all of a sudden who have never, never, ever talked about race before. Now they're holding these summits and they're saying some real blasphemous things because they never had to talk about this before. And now they want to talk about it because it is the involved thing to do. And a lot of black preachers are trying to preach black liberation and never preached it and don't know how to do it mm -hmm. because they don't have anything within their theological framework that helped them. And the best thing that I can tell people in that situation is that you need to sit and learn and listen before you jump out there because, because people are hurting. People are angry. People are upset. People are still in the streets, Pete, yep. from Memorial Day. I know it's not on TV like it was, but no, please do not think that people are not. They're downtown Marching. Memphis tonight. <laughs> right. Oh, they're still out. They're still out. They're still out. And, 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 so, and so people are now looking. They're looking for allies. They're looking for co-conspirators. They're looking for comrades. They're looking for uh, 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 people that will ride with them. But they're also looking for people who are going to be authentic and going to come correct, not coming like they have all of the answers. Because you really don't, especially if you never had to wrestle with race in your theological outlook. Mm -hmm. Why are you trying to host a race summit? Why are you trying to, you, 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 yeah, you can, you can pay for it, I guess, or you can underwrite it, but you need to be in the audience and you need to be listening. So, yeah. So I found that to be really fascinating that people who have grown up in church, the white proponent who have grown up in church, who were some were even ministers that we interviewed, but they really looked at their tradition and they said, there's nothing in my tradition that tells me I should be out here. Matter of fact, my tradition tells me I'm wrong, that I'm sinning because I'm out here with these protesters. But I feel that it's right. And I know it's right. And for others, for black proponents, never been in, you know, left the church a long time ago, don't want to have anything to do with the church because they think the church is fake and phony but they are drawing on every ounce of that black church tradition mm -hmm. to, to justify their uh, uh, being out uh, in the streets. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, the white theological tradition, um, at least at a kind of a popular level, yep. I think it's in academics too, is we've had a very individualized and spiritualized um, Christianity, uh, white Christianity in the United States. Um, and it's definitely tied into the, the justification for slavery uh, and, the, and then the justification for Jim Crow and beyond is that th this uh, theology that, that said, you know, the gospel is just concerned about individual salvation and it's just not going to heaven. And so it's not about real freedom, uh, you know, actual earthly freedom. It's only about freedom from individual moral failure, individual sin, uh, so that the individual goes to heaven. So it's all about spiritual, the spiritual life, which is disconnected from the, from one's public life. And that's been a very convenient, uh, theology within a lot of white Christianity. Mm. Yep. Yep. That's it. And, and so when you, so if that's your theological founding or foundation, framework 
How then can you leap from that to get to the social? How can you get to the systemic? How, uh, it doesn't make sense to you. It just doesn't, it just, it, and, and so, so you're stuck. And, and, and you're trying to, uh, um, you just want everybody to be saved. If everybody is saved, everything is gonna be all right. And we're saying that there's a systemic issue attached to this, that even the saved folk can go into a room, for instance, and if the, the systemic issues are not being addressed, that saved person can just, and this is Walter Wink again, he, that saved person can just be just as fallen as anyone else. Then what do you do? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can't, so there is a critique for the systems of the world uh, that's causing the oppression. And if that's you individually, you ought to check yourself and practice a little bit of that piety. But um, um, for the most part, if you do not have a critique on the systems of this world, then there is no really, uh, I'm hard pressed to have you really understand or talk about race or racism. Well, it just wouldn't make any sense. Well, and it's, it's what happens. I can't think of the minister's name right now with the guy in Atlanta who wanted to talk about uh, the blessing of slavery. Yeah, right. The, the Louis uh, Gigolo, I think his name is Gigolo. Yeah, with Lecrae and the founder of, um, of um, Chick-fil-A. Yeah, they, I mean, why though? Because white, and he said this, white fragility is a problem. I mean, white privilege. When we say white privilege, white people get, you know, stand backish, you know, it's like, you know, it pricks white folk. But if we can just reframe it, that's what he's saying, you know, you know, using all this privilege, right, to just reframe, <laughs> I say, white blessings. And then you, they would know, and, and what he said, they would know then that the blessings of slavery is what is allowing us white people to live like we are living. Mm -hmm. well, and, the, you know. <laughs> yeah, the strange thing about that is that, because I listened, I, I was really struck by his comments of like how idiotic they were. So I thought, you know, I have to listen to more of this. Uh, to, to understand the theological context for the idiocy, right? And the and the interesting thing to me is that he was he tied it into his theology of atonement. That mm. to talk about the cross as a blessing, if you can talk talk about the cross as a blessing, then you can talk about, talk about. slavery as a blessing, right. and then you can talk about sort of the the current racial arrangement in the United States as a right. blessing, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't call it white privilege, you call it white blessing. And, and there's this sense of, of the, and that's the, the kind of the individualizing and spiritualizing right, of right. the cross, that the cross was not a political execution. The cross was just this sort of divine action that, that God crucified Jesus. Right. Uh, and that's, I mean, that kind of bad theology <laughs> leads to really bad ethics. <laughs> right, and, and, exactly, and, exactly. And so, so a liberation understanding of the cross is, or, 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 or even just a non-atonement, not even liberation, non-atonement mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, theory of the cross would just say, hey, that's a state execution. They thought they were just getting rid of, and this is what I say, they just thought they were just getting rid of one bad dude. Uh, matter of fact, it wasn't a big deal. At least two other crucifixions were going on right. at the same time. So, hey, let's just put Jesus up there and make three. And, you know, hey, let's just get rid of this and go on about our business. That right there, that interprets just a little piece I just shared there. If that becomes your foundational theological understanding of the cross, your whole theology begins to change mm -hmm. just off that. Yeah. Just off that, because it's no longer an atonement, sacrificial death. It's like, you know, if Jesus needed to die, he would have just showed up and just said, hey, I'm going to the cross to die for everybody. Jesus had a ministry and tried to get folks to understand and try to believe that the kingdom of God was now at hand here. If you would just believe it and receive, just believe it and just hear it. But, you know, um, 
Jesus went the way of the prophets, right? He went the way of the folk who try to speak truth to power. He went the way of the folk who stand up. And um, that's what usually and typically happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a, a question from yes. one of the uh, attendees that's related to what we've been talking about. So how does Christian ethics and, and theology and practices and institutions then contribute to the struggle for racial justice? So we've been doing kind of this critique of like how they don't right. contribute. Right. So let's turn it around and say, how can they contribute? I have a good, good, good question because a lot of institutions are going through this right now. And that's a good thing. At least people are at least making an attempt. And um, I guess the first thing that you do is to acknowledge that um, we need to do this. That's good. Second thing is, depending on who you are and where you are stuff, you're looking at your, your gifts and your abilities and you decide what it is that you can do. Because see, what, 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 what I don't want to get into, what a lot of people try to get into sometimes, and I think it falls woefully short, is to try to give blanket um, things to do for everybody. And depending on your institution, you may not, you, you, you you know um um what's the um the corporation just just uh, Netflix I think, I guess it was Netflix just gave like 120 million dollars to uh, Morehouse and Spelman and um, United Negro College Fund. Well, you know um, um your institution or a institution may not be able to do that, but whatever it is that you can do, I do believe that the spirit will lead and the spirit will guide. And if you are in conversation with people uh, that are going to walk with you and partner with you so you can be, now you just don't want to do it capriciously like, you know, I'm coming in and saving the day. You want to be what you mentioned earlier, Pete, about your teachers. Who are your teachers? The people that were on the street, the homeless folk. They taught you and you were uh, open to be t taught by them. So we must, began to be open to be talked by people that we did not in the past think had anything to teach us. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I like to talk about is black truth, because a lot of this could have been handled or at least addressed if folk believed black truth. Black people have been telling you this, all this stuff been going on for years. Yes. You know, all of a sudden now, um, Quaker Oats and and, and you don't want to change the imagery on their boxes. I mean, and, and in their statement, they say, now is the time. I mean, okay, I mean, we, we all get to it at different times, I get it. But, but please don't, don't, don't insult us by saying that, you know, all of a sudden now you discovered this or you, you knew this all along. Either A, you ignored it, or B, you just did not want to believe black truth. Black folk have been telling you this forever. Poor folk, let me just widen it, been telling you about their plight forever. And all of a sudden, it takes a um, pandemic and to get people to think, well, what if I do, if I don't get my paycheck, I need a, we need a stimulus bill. We need this, that, and the other. And poor folk been like, hey, uh, <laughs> yeah. So individuals, I mean, institutions need to come together and need to be in conversation with the people that they purport to, you know, to partner with to decide what it is it that they are going um, um, to do to address um, these inequities and, um, and how they have benefited and just own up. How have they benefited on these inequities as well? Yeah, I think that's a... Um since the Memphis Theological Seminary building there is, is right behind you. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I'm right I, outside. I'm right outside. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, my office is just off of your shoulder there. Right. Uh, <laughs> but when I go into that building, I, I know that that was built by a cotton baron in the early 1900s. The seminary bought the building in the early 60s. And so it's important to honor the people who were the servants uh, in that building and to, and to know that story. Uh, it makes me think also of what the Pink Palace Museum is doing right now, which is uncovering its own history 
Um, it's very fascinating that, that the land that the Pink Palace is on, you know, we all knew it belonged to the founder of Piggly Wiggly, but oh no, before that, it belonged to a black <laughs> farmer. Mm. Uh, and the, and the, it was basically taken from him. Right. Um, so, but and, and I want to connect this back to the theological, uh, is, is that particular question of, this is where, I, theologically, we have to think of where is God? Uh, mm. And if, if a person is a person of faith, relationship with God should be central. Right. And Jesus, at least, uh, and, but it's in the Jewish scriptures and it's in, in Islam as well, is that God comes to us through the stranger. Uh, mm. So if you're a person like me who's white, white male, uh, straight white male, where do I go to meet God? I don't go to meet God with other straight white males. Mm. Um, I need to go meet God with uh, people of color, uh, mm. African Americans, especially in, you know, I think in the context of the United States, uh, Native Americans, um, and wow. the people who have not been at the center who are other to me, uh, mm. my experience. And, and so uh, if there's a theological motivation um, for me is that I meet God uh, in the other. It's why people who are on the streets can be my teachers is that because Jesus himself said that whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. And Jesus is saying, look, that's where I am. Right. Uh, as I used to tell my Christian brothers, university students, I, and I do the MTS students too, that, you know, if your church is boring, there's a reason that it's boring is because Jesus is not there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus left the building, you know, he left a long time ago when the building, the people in that building were all the, became all the same. All the same, right. Um, all the same people of, of a certain race and, and class, and Jesus is not there. Mm. Uh, so that's why you got to get out of the building. And I think that's a, so if somebody's asking about sort of the theological resources for uh, engagement in work for racial justice from a white theology a perspective of a white person doing theology, I have to say um, that I'm drawn into racial justice because that's where God is present. That's where mm. God is active. Um, mm -hmm. And if I want to be part of a God movement, I need to be part of uh, Black Lives Matter movement. If I'm with sort of the All Lives Matter folks, uh, I'm not hanging with God very much. Wow. I think that is nicely put, my friend. And that's why uh, many a student have sat under your feet and have learned so much. <laughs> so we thank you. <laughs> well, it, and again, it's because of the teachers that I've had. Oh. Um, on the streets, but also uh, black liberationists and womanist theologians who have taught me uh, and mentored me uh, mm -hmm. along the way. I mean, I have to, you know, shout out to Barbara, Dr. Barbara Holmes. Yes. <laughs> uh, who, you know, the dean here, but uh, two times before me. <laughs> it's why I'm at Memphis Theological Seminary. She recruited me uh, to the seminary and mentored me uh, when I got there and had already been mentoring me unofficially before that. So mm -hmm. that's that, right. That's the right. Yeah. Shout out to Barbara Holmes, Dr. Reverend Barbara Holmes. Oh my God. She was, and she is awesome. She was awesome when she was at Memphis Theological and she's still awesome. And she is still a, um, a friend and a mentor of mine. Mm -hmm. So yes. So I'm going to encourage people. We have a, a number of attendees uh, we've had some questions uh, that we've been addressing, but I'd encourage other folks who are uh, participating uh, to uh, use that question and answer feature on Zoom mm -hmm. and, and submit some questions. Uh, and while you're thinking about your questions, I, I'll, uh, Andre, tell me a little bit about um, what you see as the strengths of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, now. Right. Uh, oh. And, and, and both nationally, but also to think about more locally here in Memphis. Uh, what are the strengths and, and what are the challenges ahead? I can remember, Pete, I, I, um, we were working on the book. So this is, the project uh, started like 2015, 2016. We started interviewing folk. And so in 2017, we were writing up um, 
um, you know, transcribed the interviews, got everything together. 2018 is when the hardback edition came out. And two years later, you know, next month, the paperback is going to come out. But I can remember right after the book comes out, people were really asking, oh, what happened to Black Lives Matter? What they're doing? What's going on? I don't hear about them no more. Mm -hmm. And Black Lives Matter had never stopped working the different chapters in these cities never stop working blm the official blm chapter right here in memphis tennessee met um almost weekly every week doing things um teaching educating trying to get people to understand what it means to say black lives matter within a context uh, of politics trying to push for economic justice prison reform um the bail fund the whole notion about cash money bail, all of those type of things. People have already been working, but it, it, it so when this erupted, you know, and when people be, came back out in massive numbers, all of a sudden it's like, oh, Black Lives Matter is rebirth. It, re it never went anywhere. Black Lives Matter means just simply that, Black Lives Matter. They matter, no more, no less, they just matter. And, and, and quite frankly, if you cannot affirm that and just Black Lives Matter, period, within a context, if we were talking about Black lives, then, you know, you might want to do some self-reflection. That, that's a problem. If you, because in order for all lives to matter, in order for all lives mattering, Black lives got to matter. Mm -hmm. Unless you don't think that black lives are part of all lives. And quite frankly, let's just be real, it's maybe not a majority, but some folk of faith still think that today. That, you know, that non-white folk are simply inferior. That's their theological grounding. And somehow they just make do and have to work with some black folk, but they really don't think that they are equal. And if you poll them, they will let you know. Not a majority, but enough in order for people to, to say, wait a minute, if you're thinking that, somebody else must be thinking that, somebody else must be teaching that. So what Black Lives Matter means is that. But let me just tell you what some of the people in the book said. Instead of me, it means respect. It means honor. It means empowerment. It means that I can do for myself. It means that I can start over if I mess it up. Why? Because I'm human too. And that's another thing. Black Lives Matter affirms the humanity, the humanity of Black lives, all Black lives. And that is so important. That was, if there was any, uh, chapter one of the book, we tried to talk about uh, the similarities that you know, a lot of folk would say, this is not your grandparents' movement. Uh, this is not uh, what they used to do. We got a new different thing. Not, not, not really. You, you're doing some of the same stuff. Even, even when those folk were in their Sunday best, they still were met with dogs and water hoses. So, I mean, yeah. But what, there is one material difference. Whereas with the civil rights movement, um, the whole notion was this idea of what we call the perfect victim. That in order to elicit white sympathy, I had to lift up this virtuous person. Mm -hmm. So Rosa Parks, instead of Claudette Colvin, gets, mm -hmm. you know, the rallies and support. And if you don't know about that story, you can look that up. Um, um, but, but she gets the support instead of Claudette Cole. What Black Lives Matter said, bump that. Black Lives Matter, period. I don't care what you were doing last night, last week, or what's on your record. You're still a human. Mm -hmm. I pushed when I was um, um, teaching at the seminary, when we were doing urban theology or we were doing some class, uh, I think it was um, uh, the rhetoric and race class. I really pushed the students and say, now what is more theologically grounded what is more in the image of god the omega day that that person is saying that you are still human versus 
well, we can't use you. We got to get somebody else that's perfect. So when Mike Brown um, was killed uh, and, and shot by Darren Wilson, uh, people were like, I remember these conversations because I was up in Ferguson and, and you know this and took a class there, all that. And people would say, you, you need a better victim. If you would just got somebody and then Terrell Rice happened. Like almost, you know, a couple of months later, here comes Tamir Rice, 12 years old. And I'm like, okay, you with us now? Yeah. He's a boy. He's a little innocent boy playing with a toy guy. Oh, you still not. Oh, okay. You were just saying, oh, okay. Okay. So the, the notion that the humanity of Black lives mattering was a revelation to a lot of people and causes for celebration, but also causes for consternation for some of the older uh, civil rights veterans who was like, you know, no, we need, you know, and, and you get into this language of he didn't deserve this or he didn't deserve to be shot because he was in school or he was on his way to become a doctor. He had straightened up his life. And Black Lives Matter say, no, 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 stop that language. He doesn't deserve or she doesn't deserve to be shot and killed because she is human, <laughs> period. And so this is what Black Lives Matter means. I'm gonna uh, one go question from one of the participants. Um, well, that Jason, I saw his hand go up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I encourage people to type them into their question and answer to the Q&A section and we we'll, we'll definitely get to the questions. Um, should African-Americans create their own importance to add with white people's acceptance of African-Americans? Their own importance? Yeah, I'm not sure what... Um, yeah. If, if, the, if the questioner is saying, um, should uh, African-Americans highlight or... Um, what I'm trying to say, highlight or, 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 or speak up about their importance, maybe. I, I guess if, if that's what you, uh, if the questioner is um, um, I'm saying that. But I do believe that the statement Black Lives Matter is decorative or declarative, that's the word, declarative enough. Black Lives Matter, period. That, 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 that's all, Black Lives Matter. Can you affirm that? Can you affirm that? With no buts, no yes, but no, no, just stop right there. Black lives matter. Mm -hmm. And when you can affirm that, um, uh, I think that's all you really need to say because it means all of what I just got through talking about, about the humanness and about empowerment and about all of that. It was, um, it was reminiscent, um, the, at least the, the verbiage or the rhetoric or the wording was um, reminiscent of the Black Power movement that back in the late 60s and early 70s, whole lot of people had problems with that as well too. But uh, it did not make it any less true than it does even today with Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. So I've always wondered if in thinking biblically, mm -hmm. uh, how Pharaoh would have responded to a t-shirt that said, Israelite lives matter. Matter. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, to me, right. that, that's pretty much it, is that, right. uh, you know, God wasn't saying uh, Egyptian lives aren't important. No, important. <laughs> um, he's saying, you know, Israelite lives matter, and that's why they shouldn't be enslaved. Right. <laughs> right. Um, that's funny, yes. So that's, it's, this is or what mystifies me a bit that that biblical people don't get the black yeah. lives matter because that's what's always going on in in the bible with the prophets uh with the key story of the exodus with what jesus prioritizing right. the people who are hurting right you know what i'm saying i agree to say that's jesus saying blessed are the poor in luke Just right blessed are the poor mm -hmm. no no excuse me jesus uh the rich too the what about the middle class? What about middle class? <laughs> right. So, uh, no. you know, and I, I guess it's, it's a, when, a, when a, somebody's in a position of privilege and you hear um, like Black Lives Matter or Israelites' lives matter or poor people's lives matter, 
is that part of it is that it questions one's own place within that structure of oppression. Right. And that's part of the uh, part of the challenge that needs to be heard uh, in hearing and accepting Black Lives Matter. Right, right. And and so people who are on the brunt of the oppression, when they lift up their voices to say Black Lives Matter or I matter, it's a declarative statement, but it's also an invitation. If others want to take it, mm -hmm. to stop and just say, wait, you, yeah, you're right. Yeah, okay. And then ask that next question. Mm -hmm. How come you saying Black Lives Matter? Why do you have to say that at all? Surely you matter. So what am I missing here? Mm -hmm. That's the conversation that was missing. That has been missing in this whole seven years. It's like, but now I think, you know, um, people now are asking this question and saying, oh, okay. You know, people are now asking the question, why are people in the middle of the night, 12 midnight, marching in the streets? Mm -hmm. I mean, no, that don't sound, so something must, no, that, that, no that, that's not normal. So why are they doing that? Then all of a sudden, you start to get the answers. You'll be like, oh, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation to know and to learn and to know and then to go out and do better and be better. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. We're at almost at our 8.30 cutoff time. I think this is probably a good place to end with, yeah. with that statement. Thank you, uh, Reverend Dr. Andre Johnson for Thank all you. that you do in the community. Thank you, participants as well. Yeah. Thank you, participants. We're, We're delighted to have you on. Uh, let you know that uh, we've been recording this, and it will be put up on the Memphis Theological Seminary website if you wanted to view it again uh, or share it with friends. And Andre, you are sharing it as well on Facebook. Is that correct? Yes, I am on my page, and it will be on the Gifts of Life Ministries page, um, as well as the um, G Life Public Advocacy and Social Justice um, Ministry page as well. So you have ample opportunities to see the great Pete Gacky and, you know, the bootleg scholar. <laughs> Ain't no bootleg scholar. Well, Andre, thank you so much. Thank you thank for you, continuing man. to teach me and, and so many others. And oh. um, we'll continue for the struggle for Black Lives Matter. Thank you. All right. Thank um, you. Thank you. And um, anytime, anytime. Great. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.